So our final uh, recorded lecture here is going to be on kind of what happens once modern Homo sapiens, right at kind of around that kind of 20,000 year mark, when we really just have nothing but modern Homo sapiens um, populating different parts of the globe, we're going to look at kind of the early foundations of cultural practices. But before that, let's review the um, human fossil record, or essentially the members of our kind of family tree real quick. Of course, we have, uh, starting with our C. helanthropus chadensis. Um, it's it called a C. helanthropus, but it's generally lumped in with Artipithecuses because it's around the same time period. Uh, dates from seven to six million years ago, found in the uh, kind of west slash central African country of Chad. Um, it's the oldest known member, uh, member of the hominin family tree. Had an ape-like brain that was actually smaller than a chimpanzee, but had small hominin-like um, canines and was, of course, had certain elements of bipedality. We also have uh, Auroran tugenensis here. The date range from 6.5 to 5.5 million years ago. Um, we know it had a partial bipedalism because it had a bony buildup on the top of the femur. Uh, had a unique combination of ape and human features. Um, so at the time it was discovered, it was placed within its own genus, the genus Auroran, but it should be placed essentially with the Artipithecuses as well. Then we've got kind of Artipithecus ramidus here, um, our classically known as Arty, uh, dates to about 4.4 million years ago. We find them in the middle Awash region and the Gona region of Ethiopia. Of course, had a mosaic of features with an opposable big toe as well as, well as a stiff foot arch. The pelvis showed both bipedal and arboreal adaptations. The pubic symphysis was a little longer, um, as well as the uh, iliac blades on the pelvis were a little more bowl-shaped. Uh, it refutes, or kind of Artie's discovery refutes, the open grand, grassland hypothesis of bipedality. And it argues that there is a common ape-human ancestor that is not a chimpanzee. And the average height of Artie is around 3 feet 11 inches. Then moving into our earliest uh, member of the uh, genus Australopithecus, we have Australopithecus anamensis from 4.2 to 3.9 million years ago. Had bipedal adaptations to the leg bones and the wrist and hand bones were still um, arboreal. It was a direct ancestor to Australopithecus afarensis and a possible descendant of Artipithecus ramidus. And then we look at our Australopithecus afarensis, our wonderful Lucy, date range from 3.85 to 2.95 million years ago, found in uh, Ethiopia, Kenya, and Tanzania, so very wide um, home range. Had ape-like facial proportions, a brain case that was less than 500 cc's, right around the size of a chimpanzee's. Um, longer arms than legs, curved finger bones, but its uh, pelvis was distinctly bipedal, right? Average height for our Lucy was four foot 11 inches. Then we have our Australopithecus africanus, date ranging from 3.3 to 2.1 million years ago. It's very similar to afarensis, but with a larger brain. The leg bones were distinctly adapted for bipedalism. We know this by the pelvis bones as well as the uh, bicondylar angle of the femurs. Um, the shoulder girdle and wrist bones were still adapted for arboreal, right? Um, we know, uh, and this is one of the species that we have a lot of juvenile specimens. The one that's most famous is the one found by Raymond Dart called the Tong Child, right? We've talked about him in prior uh, lectures. And then, of course, we have the first member of the genus Homo, Homo habilis. Uh, date ranges from 2.4 to 1.4 million years ago. It was discovered by Lewis and Mary Leakey in Olduvai Gorge in 1960, nicknamed the Handyman, um, because this was the first of the kind of individuals or the first of the hominins that were discovered with stone tools, right? And it's our first tool maker making old one tools. 
The next member of the genus Homo that we will um, review here is Homo erectus, right, with the date range of 1.8 million years ago to around 50,000 years ago. It was a fully bipedal. This was actually um, the member of our genus that's our kind of first marathon runner with longer legs and arms, the first of our genus to move out of Africa and migrate to different parts of the world. Um, the famous specimen that we looked at was the Nariokotome boy or otherwise known as the Turkana boy, found near Lake Turkana in Ethiopia, and uh, dates to around 1.6 million years ago. And what's important about the Turkana boy is that he shows that Homo erectus would have been around six feet tall, actually a little bit taller than six feet tall because Nariokotome boy was not done growing yet. Um, so in essence, what we see here is that, you know, this is the first member of our genus to have kind of modern human body heights. Then we'll also take a look at um, this new species called Homo floresiensis. Is it a new species of Homo or just another erectus? Um, when we look at Homo floresiensis, the small size of the kind of specimen, but all of the kind of um, contextual um, information tells us that since it was found in a context with stone tools that are similar to those made by um, Homo erectus, that we really shouldn't be classifying this as a new species, right? This is just one that was dwarfed because it grew or evolved in a resource-scarce context, right? So this is a Homo erectus based on the uh, stone tool technology, um, but they want to classify it as a new species because of its small size. So this is showing you just where Homo floresiensis was found. Um, it was found in the uh, Flores Island in Indonesia. It had a very small brain size, but still made stone tools. So this was very important because it refuted the notion that brain size directly equates to intelligence, right? They were making the same technological equivalent of stone tools that larger brained Homo erectuses were making, um, but they had a much smaller brain size. In fact, much uh, similar to that of a chimpanzee. We know that they hunted pygmy elephants as well as large rodents and were also eaten by giant Komodo dragons. So you can see here, just looking at our little Homo floresiensis, it's a clear biped, and just looking at some of the features here, we can see the facial prognathism is not very exaggerated. Um, the brow ridge is actually pretty reduced, uh, but when we look at the brain case, it slopes backwards, much similar to we see in other Homo erectuses that are contemporaneous, right? So you take those kind of morphological features coupled with the stone tools that was found, and it's clear that this is just a Homo erectus that evolved in a a resource scarce context, right? Not one that, not a new species of Homo. One could also make an argument, um, you know, since we're already refuting the notion that there is really a connection between brain size and intelligence, one could also make the argument that maybe perhaps Homo floresiensis could potentially, based on its uh, skull morphology, be classified as modern human as well. But I'll also point out that, you know, those arguments kind of fall short when you look at this. Um, Brow ridge here, couple that with the um, kind of chemical dating and the stone tools that was found, really all of the evidence really points to Homo floresiensis just being another version of Homo erectus. So what is kind of next after Homo erectus, right? Homo erectus leaves Africa and we see an adaptive radiation and many more species of Homo pop up all across Eurasia, Europe, and Asia, right? So what we can really kind of glean at this point or what you should really know is that by the time Homo erectus leaves Africa, our lineage is fully bipedal, we're cooperative hunters and have distinct control over stone tool production and fire. One group of erectuses that left um, kind of Africa that have been kind of named Homo heidelbergensis around 800 to 600,000 years ago. And we know that these were probably the ancestors to Neanderthals, but really the debate is over whether do we classify them as their own species or do we just say that Neanderthals evolved out of Homo erectuses that migrated to Europe, right? Um, uh, we in this class here, um, and kind of in my opinion, were lumpers. So we're going to say that Homo heidelbergensis is not really the new species. It's just another Homo erectus, right? Because morphologically, it's not that much different. So by 100,000 years ago, there were several species of hominids all populating the Earth, including Homo erectuses or perhaps some other species of Homo if you want to buy into Homo floresiensis being a new species. In Southeast Asia, you had Neanderthals still existing at 100,000 years ago in Europe, and you had Homo sapiens existing in Africa. And by 40,000 years ago, you have this newly discovered group that we talked about, the Denisovans.
This is showing you one of our oldest uh, modern Homo sapien specimens that we have um, shortly after our kind of evolution in Africa at or around 180,000 years ago. Um, it dates to around 160,000 years um, from a, we used volcanic uh, tufts or volcanic soils in order to date it. The cranial capacity is around 1450 uh, cc's, right, which is right around the same cranial capacity on average that we have today, right? And this is distinctly a modern Homo sapien, right? You can see the tall vertical forehead, right? Uh, there's still a bit of a brow ridge, which we see in some of the archaic Homo sapien populations. Uh, you still have a little bit of an occipital bun sticking off the back here. Um, but as far as it goes, the uh, maximum cranial breadth is right up here at the top of the skull rather than more towards the bottom. So this is right along with what we see in other um, Homo sapien populations. So another overall pattern that we see is as brain size increases, um, we have more flexion of the cranial base, right? So this is always associated as a positive correlation with uh, increasing brain sizes over time. So in essence, um, you know, as brain sizes increase, you get more movement um, that's capable at your neck. So just remember, um, as you're moving through these kind of labs um, and as we kind of get through the end of the semester, one of the good ways to tell whether you're looking at a biped is to look at that foramen magnum position. Uh, the closer it is to the center of the skull, the more likely it is that you are looking at a um, bipedal creature. We also have some finds in the Middle East from the Mano Cave system, a site called Quasse. Uh, and this is a 100,000-year-old skull that was found um, in a cave along with a bunch of other fossils, including horse teeth and burnt uh, flint tools. The date suggests that these nearly modern humans left Africa much earlier than had been thought, right, and coexisted with Neanderthals, once believed to be our ancestors, right? So I really want to kind of cement the notion that as modern humans were evolving and moving around the world, we still had Neanderthals, we still had Homo erectuses, all living and kind of contemporaneously existing alongside one another. And it's very likely that since we are so genetically similar in terms of our genus, that we would have been capable of interbreeding. These are just some of the other finds that were pulled out of the uh, Mano cave system, right? We have our Adaltu or our, our uh, uh, Quafse skull right here, um, kind of in this picture. And you can tell with the high vertical forehead, right, this is distinctly, there's a little bit of facial prognathism, but not, not to a very high degree. And also I want you to notice, you know, there's no gap behind the molar, right? That's something that we classically see in Neanderthals, right? And this is generally uh, kind of what the burials look like when we find them. So they're not really purposeful burials, they're just kind of bodies that were left wherever they kind of fell. So we can see just kind of looking at this kind of cave system area, um, we can see that there's a lot of sites that have Homo sapien remains as well as Neanderthal remains, particularly this area here, we see a lot of interaction. Um, so in essence, you know, there are a lot of areas where there is interaction between Neanderthals and modern humans. This is a uh, reconstruction of the first kind of anatomically modern um, human found in Romania or the first anatomically modern human found in Europe. Um, it's one of the first uh, and it dates to around 35,000 years ago. So the question is, is, you know, once modern Homo sapiens evolve in Africa at or around 180,000 years ago and begin to start spreading out, you know, why do they migrate so frequently and why do they move around so so rapidly? Um, well, we also have, we kind of have two kind of competing hypotheses to this. We have the carrying capacity notion that the number of people and other living organisms that a region can support without environmental degradation. So essentially the humans move into an area, they breed, they populate until they can't populate no more, and then they move on. Um, there's kind of some evidence of this in some areas, but um, really there's not any kind of wide scale degradation that we see in the fossil record that would really indicate that populations got to a point where humans were forced to move on it's much more likely that what was going on was this big game hunting tradition, that modern Homo sapiens simply followed herds of big game animals known as megafauna um, out of Africa and into various parts of the world. So one of the things you'll kind of notice if you look into the literature about big game hunting for um, ancient humans is that one of the prevailing thoughts is that humans literally hunted um, big game animals to extinction. Whereas humans may have um, helped 
in terms of uh, uh, kind of finally putting them to extinction, they were already on a massive decline. When we look at the faunal and floral fossil record to and we, around the time that um, right before humans evolved, we already noted a kind of major decline in the mammalian species, right? So in summary, really, the megafauna were already kind of going extinct by the time these humans arose, right? And that was really due to how the Pleistocene was coming to an end, right? Right towards the end where the climate is beginning to shift and it's not as cold all the time like it had been during the Ice Age. This is just showing you some of the migratory paths that uh, modern humans may have taken as they moved around the world, um, kind of going out and seafaring to some of these Pacific islands, as well as moving to Australia. And you also have to take into account that during that time, you know, sea levels were much lower, right? And there was a lot more land exposed. So there were bridges that existed between um, some of these kind of island systems that allowed humans to move across without having to necessarily go through seafaring. The same principle worked with this large ice bridge in Beringia um, up here that allowed Native Americans to come across from Asia into North America. So as an example, sea levels were up to uh, 300 feet lower in the later Pleistocene area or uh, era because, you know, you had all of a sudden, you know, all that ice was still keeping a lot of that ocean water locked up. Even though it was melting, it just wasn't melting fast enough. So all of the areas you see here that are shaded in white are places where land would have been exposed during this time period. If we look at the kind of first modern Homo sapiens that settle in um, Australia, we look at Lake Mungo around 40,000 years ago. They have fully modern cranial features, and they're very similar to later finds that we find, at least anatomically, that date to around 9,000 BP in a place called Cow Swamp in Australia as well. This is a reconstruction of what uh, kind of they believe the people were subsisting at Lake Mungo. Um, Lake Mungo is no longer uh, exists today. It's actually a very dry and kind of desolate place today. Um, but back in antiquity, around 40,000 years ago, it was a kind of a place where there would have been a lot of marine life as well as um, animal life. Um, and there would have been people living along the shores here. This is an aerial view of Lake Mungo today, which you cannot call lake anymore because there's no water. So essentially it's kind of a dried out um, landscape at this point. So if we look at kind of the early modern Homo sapien migrations to North America, right, these are kind of our early um, Amerindians, our early Native Americans, people that we call the Paleo-Indians. Um, the indigenous Americans came across the Beringian land bridge sometime between 28,000 years ago and 15,000 years ago. Um, and there were several important early sites like Blackwater Draw, as well as Folsom in New Mexico, right? And we know um, they kind of produced these very distinctive um, Paleolithic projectile points that are a little bit different than what we see going on in Europe at the same time or anywhere else in the world at the same time. This is a picture of the Blackwater Draw site. So you can clearly see that there's uh, quite a few layers here of habitation. You've got some burial areas as well as some kind of um, areas where it looks like they had um, space separated off and a few fire rings. Um, so in essence, you know, this was a fairly habitated site um, that these Paleo Indians probably stayed at for quite some time. So in terms of the mtDNA, if we look at these kind of Paleo Indians, 95% of Native, Native Americans today fall into one of four haplogroups of mtDNA, right? It's either A, B, C, or D. The mtDNA from any Paleo Indian remains that we've been able to get DNA from also fall into one of those same four haplogroups. It's also important to note that because there are four haplogroups, it's likely that there were four separate migrations from the old world over to the new world through that bridge and land bridge, giving that kind of um, difference in genetic material. So in terms of genetics, right, it, it, in evolution, the continuity of these four haplogroups amongst Native Americans into modern populations means that the founding populations in the New World were likely very small, right? It also supports the notion that there were four separate migrations into the New World. 
one of the debates that genetics kind of um, helped and what really kind of led to um, solving this case was the Kennewick man from 9000 BP, which was found in the banks of the Columbia River in Washington in 1996. As of February 2017, Kennewick man's remains were finally returned to the indigenous tribes after being in museums um, up until that point. And there was a big raging debate over kind of um, the resistance of scientists to give the remains back to the Native American people because the scientists argued that they have no proof that the individual Kennewick man was actually a Native American. So the debate was really around kind of the indigenous rights over the remains of their ancestors, and it spurred the passing of federal legislation called NAGPRA, which is the Native American Grave Protection Repatriation Act. So in essence, when an archaeologist out there finds a piece of, native, of human remains, and if they suspect they're Native American, they have to go through efforts to try and repatriate or try and get those remains back to the indigenous people or their descendants that are still living today. So why was there this big debate over the Kennewick man, right? Uh, well, his skull was kind of unique compared to that of other Native American specimens. He did not have those shovel-shaped incisors, which are kind of a, a big uh, clue in the dentition as to whether an individual could be Native American. Uh, he was initially thought to be kind of a dead colonial era Russian trapper that got lost. Um, and at this point, legally, um, whoever finds ancient remains holds possession over those remains. NAGPRA really only applies to public property, right, or publicly funded excavations, right? If you find something on private property, well, the law doesn't really cover the uh, legal mandate to kind of forcibly return those remains. So in 2017, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that the University of Washington Museum has no right to keep the remains, and they were ordered to be given back to a contemporaneous Native American group for reburial, in which the remains were reburied at an undisclosed location. So as we move to this kind of last 10,000-year period, something that we refer to as the Holocene, um, this is really the period where kind of modern Homo sapiens begin to develop societies, culture, um, agriculture, um, all these kind of fundamental technological advancements that we use today, right? We see agricultural beginnings in the old world. We still see big game hunting and gathering occurring in the new world. And at the start of the Holocene, the estimated population of modern Homo sapiens across the world was between 5 and 10 million worldwide. There was still a fair, heavy reliance on these creatures called megafauna for subsistence, but these creatures were dwindling quite quickly um, at this point, right, then going extinct because the Ice Age was quickly coming to an end. So both in the old world and the new world, if we look at what was going on before the development of agriculture, right, we have hunting and gathering, um, which is obtaining all of your food from the surrounding environment without growing anything. We have wild crop watching, which is noting which wild crops produce food and promoting them via weeding and wild uh, amongst those wild plant species. So essentially what you're doing is re removing competitors without actually replanting the uh, crop plant. And then, of course, you have domestication, which is the purposeful promoting of uh, specific dietary plants or animals via planting or animal domestication. So as we move through some of your lab exercises, one of the patterns that I want you to note uh, between your kind of ancient ancestors versus what we see in modern Homo sapiens is that uh, notice that most of your ancient human fossils have relatively straight teeth and no real malocclusion, right? So remember that larger feedback loop that led to a larger brain, right? As we reduced that demand for chewing on our dentition, our jaws began to shrink, but our teeth were not shrinking at the same rate, right? Remember, we've talked about throughout the kind of latter half of the semester, this, the whole notion of mosaic evolution, right? That different parts of your body change at different rates. So it ended up becoming a situation where your jaws were essentially just too small for your teeth. And now we have kind of uh, malocclusion, we have overbites and underbites, we suffer from uh, more cavities and things like that. Um, and that's simply because of those changes that occurred at different paces. So if we look at how agriculture affected uh, human biological change, essentially human evolution has continued to the presence. Uh, most changes that we see today in human morphology and, and um, kind of um, differences in bodies and things like that are linked to the agricultural revolution, right? 
diet influences human physical appearance and changes in food relate to changes in facial structure as well. So the kind of reduction in the size of the jaw um, kind of at a faster rate than the um, size of our teeth. This is something in anthropology referred to as the masticatory functional hypothesis, right? It, changes, it, it states that changes in the skull form are a response to the decreased demands on our chewing muscles, right? So it's really that kind of change in diet that really caused, uh, coinciding with the increase in brain size, that really coincided with our um, uh, kind of dental issues that we have today. So in essence, many more individuals today suffer from crowded jaws. Tooth size has decreased, but at a pace that's different from those of the skull and the jaw decreases, right? So in essence, right, we're going to be dealing with this kind of crowded teeth issue for um, probably many, 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 many generations to come. So if we look at how those changes have occurred over time, looking at one of our more ancient species, um, kind of outlined here in the actual picture, right? This would be one of our um, archaic Homo sapiens. And as that chewing decrease, or as that chewing demand decreases, and as brain size increases, we see the shift in the skull moving taller, more vertical, right? The forehead gets taller, and the face um, gets smaller, and the jaw and the bones around the jaw become much reduced, right? So what we're really seeing here is kind of this reduction in the bones and the muscle attachment sites um, for your chewing apparatus. During the Holocene period, we also see the emergence of the Neolithic period, right, otherwise known as the New Stone Age. This is what marks the domestication of animals and early cultigens, as well as the development of pottery. And the Neolithic period, you know, in a lot of Western civ classes, they make it seem like um, your uh, agriculture happens in the Middle East and then spreads out to the rest of humanity from there. That's not how it happened. A lot of these kind of developments occurred in various places at various times independently of one another. There's changes in health and social organization that also occur very rapidly during this Neolithic period. So the kind of shift or the agricultural revolution began around 10,000 years ago, and the shift took place over many centuries and in several locations throughout the world. So although researchers largely agree on when and where the shift took place, they don't agree on the specific cause for it. The only thing that we really can say is that starting at a 15,000 year mark, we start to see steadily throughout human populations a steady decreasing in the dependence on wild plant foods for um, food or wild plants for food and a steady increase in plant domestication, right? So in essence, what we're seeing is kind of this increase uh, over time of domestication versus um, using wild plants for food. So as you can see in this chart, you know, it just shows you that agriculture itself was invented independently at dramatically different times in other areas. And even in some areas, they're kind of a little in incorrect. Um, based on more modern evidence in my own research, we know that agricultural beginnings started in kind of the eastern part of the United States around 6,000 years ago, um, not three. This is just showing you some of the different crop centers of origin. And the two that I kind of find most humorous here um, are tomatoes. And think about how, how prevalent tomatoes are in Italian cooking and some of the European cooking. And tomatoes are not native to Europe, right? They're actually a relatively recent um, kind of introduction. Um, the other one I, I, I find is interesting, or the story of it, is coffee, right? Coffee has actually has a really interesting story. The kind of king of Ethiopia gifted a coffee tree to the king of France, and the owner of the king's greenhouse um, felt that it was too selfish of the king to keep this wonderful thing called coffee only for himself and the nobility. So he arranged for a meeting with a governor who ran some of the Caribbean islands, and, and there was an agreement made for safe passage over to the Caribbean islands if he were to steal a sprig of the coffee tree. So that is essentially how coffee made it from um, Africa all the way over to the New World, right? And most of the coffee grown today in the New World comes from kind of this ancestral stock plant that came from the uh, King of France's original coffee tree. So we have a few theories behind why humans may have begun the process of domestication. Of course, we have population pressure theory, which is kind of similar to carrying capacity theories in the sense that as populations rise, people were forced to invent domestication in order to sustain life, right? You also have this notion of sedentism that maybe perhaps humans became so culturally complex that they were kind of, uh, there was this cultural shift to settling down in more permanent villages and hamlets. 
If we look at one, we have Katal Hayuk, which is a uh, one of the first cities, kind of uh, one of the first human cities in Turkey. And over the course of a few centuries, Katal Hayuk's uh, population grew in just from a couple hundred into the thousands. So what the agricultural revolution really bought us in terms of an advantage as a species is this notion of um, exponential growth in terms of um, population sizes, right? Uh, having agriculture, domesticating plants and animals allowed us to have um, a ready food supply that allowed to have surplus, right? And with surplus, you're allowed, it allows you to have higher degrees of fertility. So um, later on in the kind of the talk here, we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the deleterious health effects that we've seen over time with the introduction of agriculture. So really this is what the trade-off is. We lose a little bit in terms of individual health, but we gain a lot in terms of fertility, right? If we look at it in terms of population sizes, at 10,000 BC, we're at two to five million. At 2000 BC, we're at 250 million. At 1850, we're at over one billion humans, right? So we had an exponential explosion in population growth. So when we talk about kind of agriculture being invented independently at different places and different times, this is something that we call the regional variation model. It supports the notion that agriculture was invented independently at different places and in different times as kind of unique human adaptation to various environments. So if we look at some of these areas, um, the first one we'll look at is the Levant region in Asia. At the end of the Pleistocene, it saw intense harvesting of wheat and barley ancestors, right? As a matter of fact, we don't have those plants today. They're extinct, um, but we know that they must have been very similar to wheat or barley. We have the manipulation of plant growth cycles beginning there around 11,500 BP. And in the Jordan Valley, agriculture spread across the entire Fertile Crescent by 8,000 BP, right? And some of these villages that developed at this time actually turned into cities which still exist in some element today, like the city of Jericho. So in other areas in China, we see um, the domestication of rice and millet dates back to around 10,000 BP. Um, we have domestication of cultures in Mexico around 10,000 BP, in New Guinea around 7,000 BP, in South America around 5,250 BP, and in Africa around 4,500 BP as well. So in terms of domestication, we say that there were 11 independent places where agriculture was invented around the world, and the crop uh, plants that were used in these various areas um, differ a little bit, right? Some places you have um, a lot of wheat and grains, and some places you have a lot of fruits and vegetables. So the process of domestication itself is not really a smooth process. Most of the kind of plants that we utilize for food in the past are now extinct today. And it's hard really to determine the difference between domestication and interspecific competition in the wild, right? And what this is referring to is that paleontologists and archeologists, when they're in the field uh, examining a specific site, and they're trying to figure out whether or not this human group practice agriculture, one of the things they look for are seeds. And if they can find seed sizes or seed uh, from plants that are kind of, that produce food, if the seed sizes are a certain size, they know that, well, that plant has been under heavy selective pressure, which means that that plant must have been acted upon by humans and they must have been promoting those plants that have the larger seed size. Well, we actually have a study um, that you'll see uh, an example of Kenopodium, which you'll see pictures of in the next slide here. Um, it's actually difficult when we look at wild plants and, you know, um, kenopodium that is kind of grown in a patch with each other, those kenopodium plants will actually compete amongst one, one another in seed size as well. So we're really not 100% sure if that large seed size we're looking at anymore is evidence of agriculture or if it's actually just natural competition. So in essence, the adaptive trade-off here was population growth, right? A domestication fueled human population growth. It formed the basis for complex societies and the development of early technologies. Plants were used as both sources of food and drink. And today, two-thirds of humans' necessarily calorie or protein intake comes from key cereal grains that were domesticated in the earlier Holocene or their um, direct relatives. 
So as part of that kind of adaptive trade-off, right, of course we have environmental degradation, cultural and technological changes also kind of have negative consequences as well, right? Population has increased from 2 million to more than 7 billion in the last 10,000 years, and competition for resources essentially is straining the global environment today. As part of the adaptive trade-off of agriculture, right, we also have environmental degradation, right? Um, it's actually well documented and began around 10,000 BP. The process of domesticating and raising plants and animals affected world uh, biodiversity, right? Basically, biodiversity went down. And unchecked population growth could lead to food crisis as we use up all of the arable land. One of the examples I like to use of kind of ancient um, environmental degradation is the example of Cahokia. And what what really happened in Cahokia is you had this really large kind of city state that occurred in um, Missouri, and it was a Native American civilization. And it, at the time of its height, it was the largest city in the world. Um, and what really happened here is that these people had to use wood in order to heat their homes and to, you know, feed themselves and cook their food. And when you have a population this large, if subsisting off of kind of hunting, gathering, um, particularly using wood as fuel, um, you end up deforesting the entire area around your settlement. So the people at Cahokia ended up having to travel further and further over time to acquire the daily firewood that they needed. So it just essentially became untenable for them to really congregate in that large of a population in that area. So the kind of city state itself really collapsed. So animal domestication occurred around 15,000 BP, and I want you to know that it is not oxes or cows or um, some sort of draft animal that was the first animal to be domesticated. Um, it was actually the dog, right? And we've actually even found dog burials or purposeful dog burials that are much older, around 20-some thousand years ago. So dogs have been with kind of humans for a very, very long time. It wasn't until about that 10 to 5,000 BP mark that we really see the domestication of oxen, cows, sheep, and other kind of um, animals that we're more familiar with today as terms of domesticated animals. One of the things that tends to increase during this kind of Holocene period is warfare or interpersonal violence, right? Um, and we kind of, in anthropology, we ask, well, why do humans conduct warfare? If for so much of our evolutionary history we've selected towards cooperation with one another, why do we have these levels of interpersonal violence? Well, obviously, it's not really a very easily answered question, right? Warfare today is conducted for different reasons culturally. Um, in the past, we know that in Native North America, there were actually several forms of ritualized warfare. And among the Dani, which is a, a tribal group in New Guinea, there's a thing called blood feuding, where if one member of the tribe is killed, you are culturally obligated to kill a member of the opposing tribe to kind of regain spiritual balance. If we look at some of the varying kind of explanations for warfare that have been proposed, we have the socio-biological explanation proposed by Napoleon Chagnon, who's an anthropologist who worked amongst the Yanomamo in Venezuela and Brazil. And he said that warfare was reproductively advantageous. He noted that amongst the Yanomamo, men that were successful warriors had more wives and fathered more children, right? So amongst the Yanomamo, uh, the kind of use of warfare, the function of warfare was to um, – boost reproductive advantage. We also have the bottleneck theory, which says that warlike societies will occur wherever populations are bottlenecked um, geographically, like Latin America or Mesoamerica. Uh, if we look at biological explanations, humans are naturally aggressive, like our chimpanzees' cousins. Um, unfortunately, the biological explanation really doesn't hold much merit anymore um, because humans are, in essence, are not essentially or exclusively controlled by our hormonal urges. And then, of course, we have the anthropological theory, which says that uh, it's prestige, status, boundary maintenance, and the kind of enforcement of power, which is the reasoning behind warfare in societies. This is just showing you some blunt force trauma wounds, and these become very kind of common during this Holocene period. So there's definitely an increase in kind of people um, combating with one another and causing these kind of um, traumas to each other. This is showing you a projectile um, injury. Actually, this person, individual shot through the side of the head with a uh, stone arrow point.
So the earliest kind of war, you might be kind of curious, when did warfare really start? Well, um, the earliest recorded war we have is a war that occurred in 2700 BC. It was a war between Sumerian kingdoms, the kingdom of Kish and the kingdom of Elam, right? And of course, the kingdom of Kish wins. Uh, but the question really is, is how do we define war? Was this the first war? Was it the first recorded war? Is war simply a matter of killing one another or does war have to have the added um, implement or the added element of kind of taking resources or spoils as well we actually have war evidence of warfare kind of in this sense a little bit earlier at 9500 bc at a place called nataruk which is near lake Turkana. this was a deliberate mass killing and we think based on um what was happening here, this is where archaic homo sapiens showed up to the site with weapons, right? And they, they, they killed every single individual that was living at that site. So we think that this may have actually been done, or this may have been premeditated war, pre warfare over um, the resources that were kind of abundant in this kind of Natarak Lake Turkana area. This is showing you one of the individuals that was found at Natarak. So it, essentially this individual um, basically died uh, lying face down on the ground and was kind of left wherever they were um, lying. This is showing you that the individuals in and of themselves actually had their hands bound behind their backs before they were killed. This is showing two individuals who were actually sleeping when they were speared multiple times. Each one of these pencils represents a place where there is damage from a stone spear tip. So if we look at some of the varying forms of warfare that we see in Native North America, one of the ones I want to bring your attention to is called uh, prestige warfare, or more or less the practice of counting coup. Um, and this is why, you know, people get so incensed when they see individuals wearing Native American headdresses, because those individuals don't generally understand what the meaning behind one of those headdresses is. Um, in a lot of those Amerindian groups, those headdresses are earned, right? They're actually, every single feather on that headdress corresponds to an actual event in that individual's lifetime and they earn that feather through either courageousness or whether or not they were wounded during a battle or whether or not they killed an enemy and the notion of counting coup is this kind of practice amongst uh plains tribes uh horse tribes where they would ride up to an enemy and get close enough to tap them with this coup stick right it wasn't really necessarily warfare in the sense of they were trying to kill the enemy it was warfare in the sense of they were trying to prove bravery or trying to build their own uh prestige we also have mourning war amongst Native American groups, which is very similar to kind of those um, blood feuding amongst the Dani. A raiding party is conducted to mourn the loss of a tribal member. Usually during these raiding parties are seeking trophies such as severed fingers, ears, or arms. And this is not necessarily conducted to diminish the opposing group, much like that prestige warfare. It's not done to destroy your enemy. It's done to regain spiritual balance or to build prestige. We also have raiding warfare, right, which is done to conduct, uh, with, to steal resources, right? And those resources can be food, raw materials, or people, right? And this isn't necessarily slavery in the sense that we classically know as slavery. In a lot of Amerindian groups, people that were captured were turned into slaves and then eventually um, uh, kind of adopted into the tribe, right? And raiding parties are generally usually or loosely organized around a war chief, right? And in some American groups, there are no raiding party leaders, right? A, a group of men just decide one day that they want to conduct a raid and they run off and do it and come back with raw materials. If we look at another kind of the um, side effects along with kind of cultural complexity, warfare, and the development of technology, we also have the kind of um, increase in the occurrence of disease that occurs as a result of agricultural technologies, right? So there was actually little infectious disease before the advent of agriculture. And how do we know this? Well, we look at the periosteal layer or the mark that that layer leaves on the bones of individuals that we find, right? What we're looking for is something called a periosteal reaction, right? It's an inflammatory response of the outer layer of bone tissue, which causes a mark to be left on the bone. This tells us that that individual was dealing with um, infectious diseases. 
So this is showing you an extreme periosteal reaction in which it caused the bone to continue producing um, uh, kind of apparent bone cells. And this is, um, you know, just the kind of other side of this uh, femur here, right? This femur is completely normal. And this one is completely malformed and has way too much um, bone uh, attached to it, right? And this is what happens when you deal with chronic infection. So agriculture also caused um, changes in, to the workload and activity, right? So changes in workload and activity have also affected the human physical appearance over time, right? Bone responds to the stresses that are put on it over the course of a lifetime. So how hard someone works over their life will actually affect their skeleton. So studies on the strength of bones in different populations illustrate the response to changing workloads. In a general evolutionary sense, though, the trend in humans is to a smaller, more gracile skeleton, right? And the notion that these loads and forces on your bone uh, or that you put on your bone over time affect your skeleton is known as Wolf's Law. Unfortunately, there are some kind of problems that we have with Wolf's Law and kind of this uh, evolutionary trend that they say or that they claim they say. So researchers essentially claim that workload directly affects the density of bones, right? So the more workload, the more bone, right? Well, what we see is in hunter-gatherer societies who actually have much denser bones than agriculturalists actually spend less time of their day working than do agriculturalists, right? So this kind of notion that workload affects bone density is kind of bunk. What we should really be looking at it is from a kind of a dietary perspective. How does diet affect bone density? So with kind of health in the agricultural revolution, right, population crowding and the development of agriculture or the development of infectious diseases. So with this increase in population size and density in these areas, the um, it caused the spread of more infectious disease and diet itself was also infected, right? Because when you're sick, you don't eat as much. So uh, these bones can reveal the kind of presence of infectious illnesses even after hundreds of years of being in the ground, right? So current studies suggest that treponemal diseases or treponematosis diseases affected many populations around the world. And tuberculosis was also found very early around the world and kind of um, developed during this kind of agricultural revolution. Yaws is one of our kind of treponemal diseases that we see. Another one that we see is, of course, um, syphilis. And these are diseases that developed very, very shortly after the development of agriculture. So if we look at another health consequence of the agricultural revolution, right, um, we also have tooth decay, right? Dental caries or cavities increased exponentially after certain plants like corn were introduced into the diet, right? What this did is it caused changes in our oral bacteria over time. So essentially, we also have nutritional consequences due to missing nutrients, right? When we were hunter-gatherers, we had actually more nutrient availability than agriculturalists. As you kind of invest in these certain stock or these certain kind of um, crops, plants, your nutritional availability or the kind of nutrients you're getting from your uh, overall diet may actually decrease, causing nutritional deficiencies. So we have reduced growth or abnormal development, right? So a lack of essential nutrients leads to smaller body size and develop more mental abnormalities over time. So bones and teeth, in essence, provide an excellent way of assessing dietary changes and nutritional deficits that we see over time. This is showing a cross section of a modern human tooth that has a couple of cavities there. And this is kind of my little PSA here showing you that, um, you know, when you look at your tooth on the surface, you know, your cavity may appear to be very small, but it's much like a, a, a cavern or a cave in kind of geologic sense, right? The opening is usually much smaller than the actual cavern is itself. This is showing you a kind of a timeline in terms of Amerindian populations in the eastern woodlands, which is the kind of eastern part of North America here. So, and this is showing you that as they move forward and kind of from 10,000 BC onward, you see this huge exponential increase in the amount of cavities.
So one of those kind of nutritional deficiencies that we see a lot during this agricultural revolution period is kind of, and one of the diseases we see kind of overall in general in humans today is this um, iron deficiency, which causes anemia. And we can see this in the skull through um, this notion of parotid hyperostosis, or if you're looking in the eye orbits, you have this condition called cribra orbitalia that occurs. Um, so they're also uh, across the world, right, heights uh, in overall human adult heights have been on the decline throughout time, right? So this essentially is not an adaptive response to poor food resources, right? This is a general pattern that we see. As we make that shift to a more gracile skeleton, overall human heights have been decreasing over time. So why are some of these ancient populations in the old world and in the new world so iron deficient? Well, too much reliance on something like corn, wheat, or rice as a staple crop will cause iron deficiency. Uh, having foods that are high in phosphorus can bind to the iron within your body and make it unusable. So if you're eating too many wild nuts, fish, or whole grains, or too much reliance on non-heme iron or plant iron in your diet, which is um, not as efficiently absorbed as um, iron from meat is. So we've talked about this a little bit in kind of uh, earlier lectures talking about enamel hypoplasias, which are episodes or kind of uh, marks on the teeth that are left by episodes of starvation or bouts of infectious disease, right? What it does is it disrupts the function of the ameloblasts, which are the cells that produce enamel. But once you get... Uh, once you get efficient nutrition again, and once you kind of get over the infection, um, those ameloblasts continue to produce um, enamel. We also have some other nutritional deficiencies that we see. If you have a lack of B1 or thiamine, you'll get a disease called beriberi. If you have a lack of niacin, you'll have a disease called pellagra. A uh, lack of vitamin E can cause chronic migraines. If you have lack of iodine, you can have goiter syndrome. And of course, you have vitamin, uh, lack of vitamin D will cause rickets. We talked about that um, uh, when we talked about modern human variation, as well as a lack of vitamin C, which will cause scurvy. So if agriculture turned out to be so kind of bad for the individual, why did we really farm? Well, agricultural practices in essence increased human fertility. The average fertility rates at this time or during this agricultural revolution increased as much as 70% after agriculture was introduced. And in essence, you're able to get more calories per land unit and more food resources for population increases, whether or not those food resources are as nutritionally sound as you need them to be. So as we kind of move into uh, present time here and looking at modern humans and kind of our species today, the question is, is, well, where do we go from here? Is evolution or are humans still evolving, right? Well, it's likely that selective pressures from this point forward in the future will all be anthropogenic, meaning that they are man-made or um, a lot of the changes we could see could be related to sexually selected trends, right? Kind of sort of the classic things that we look at in terms of evolutionary science. So if we look at some of these anthropogenic or man-made selective pressures, we have population size, which limits lifespan. We have global warming, which will inevitably limit lifespan. Um, we also have pollution, which will inevitably limit lifespan. But we also have increases in medical technology, which will extend lifespan. So we have to kind of work on having more factors that extend lifespans as opposed to limit lifespans. So as we kind of wrap up here, remember our important steps in human evolutionary history, right? The development of bipedality, starting with our kind of earliest Cihelanthropus chadensis, moving through to our Australopithecine group. Uh, the development of cooperative hunting with kind of our later Homo erectus, uh, as well as language and tool production, and the development of culture along with that agricultural revolution. So to kind of cinch things in with our lumper argument here in terms of this is what I want you guys to kind of pull out in terms of what our actual human lineage is, um, we all kind of agree that we start at Australopithecus afarensis, moving to Homo habilis, to Homo erectus, then to Homo neanderthalensis, and on to Homo sapiens, right? But it's important to know that these three all existed at the same time alongside, and there's significant overlap with their um, evolutionary timelines. 
So from this point forward, we're really looking at culture as a means of driving human evolution, right? And how do we define culture in physical anthropology? Well, culture, um, according to Lewis uh, B. Benford here, who was featured at the bottom, um, culture is humans' extra somatic means by which we adapt to our environment. But we also have defining culture in other ways, right? Um, from, coming from cultural anthropology, we have the anthropologist Edward Burnett Tyler, who defined culture as the complex whole, which includes knowledge, beliefs, arts, morals, law, customs, and any other capabilities and habits acquired by a human as a member of a society. Um, and something that's interesting about Edward Burnett Tyler is he actually later became a huge um, spiritualist and believed to the day of his death that he could communicate with the dead. So one of the trends that we do see, other than kind of decreasing human heights over time, is this notion of facial neoteny. Our facial proportions are actually becoming less spaced together over time, right? So our facial proportions are becoming smaller and more kind of baby-like, right? This is what, what we mean by facial neoteny. So this is kind of what human faces look like today. And in the next couple of slides, you're going to see what human faces will look like over the next kind of couple hundred thousand years. And by the end of it, we're all going to kind of look like Japanese anime characters. So this is it, and it kind of concludes our course in human evolution. So be sure to get all of your lab assignments done by the end of the semester. Be sure to study and take the exams. Um, unfortunately, we don't have any ability to do any exam reviews, but they are now open book. And um, I really appreciate all of you taking my class, and I hope that you were able to learn something. And I wish you all the best of luck in kind of these uncertain times with the coronavirus. And I wish you all the best of luck in terms of um, your careers in the future.